Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is Episode 2, The Roots of Sci-Fi in Satire. I mentioned last episode that there are two schools of thought about the origin of science fiction. One sees sci-fi as an outgrowth of fantasy, myths, and fairy tales going all the way back to before the invention of writing. I'll admit there's a grain of truth to this. Early science fiction writers took a lot of inspiration from mythology. For example, the subtitle of Frankenstein was The Modern Prometheus, which of course comes from a Greek myth. But I subscribe to the second school of thought, that science fiction is a modern invention of the Enlightenment growing slowly and organically as writers in other genres, not fantasy, began incorporating modern science into their works. This is even clearer when you trace backwards, as I like to do in this show. If you follow classic sci-fi ideas like space travel, alien life, and even robots back to their earliest incarnations, you wind up in a surprising place, namely satire. Several of the works frequently cited as the quote-unquote first science fiction novel, such as Sir Thomas More's Utopia in 1516 and Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels in 1726, were satire. So were several of the classics of the 19th century. Personally, I regard this as science fiction only in the loosest sense. For example, Jonathan Swift was making fun of the science of his time, even using it to criticize the society of his time, but he wasn't using it to tell a story, at least not in any sense we would recognize today. The Lilliputians, the Yahoos, and everything in between were all closer to creatures from fantasy and myth than scientifically imagined. When we call Gulliver's Travels science fiction, what we are really seeing is a sort of proto-science fiction, in which the existing genre of satire was incorporated with the new scientific discoveries of the Enlightenment. That's why I don't consider it a new genre yet, but still an important root of the concept today. And really, I'm also using the word satire kind of broadly. Some of the works in this category were not really parodies, but they were still meant to be rhetorical or instructional, rather than just telling a story. Anyway, let's look at a couple of common sci-fi tropes to see what I'm talking about, like space aliens. Aliens definitely have parallels with angels or spirits or beings visiting Earth from some other world. But in their earliest appearances, they were not really an updated version of those kinds of stories. What we think of as space aliens, that is, flesh and blood beings from another world with advanced technology and nothing mystical about them, don't really show up until later. They do appear in at least one ancient text, Lucian's A True Story, which was also a satire. But the idea first appears in modern literature, meaning post-Renaissance, in the writings of Giordano Bruno. And again, this is one of those cases that was meant to be instructional rather than satirical, but it's still not really science fiction because Bruno thought he was writing science fact, even though his supposedly visionary work was really just a lucky guess. As an aside, Bruno was infamously burned at the stake by the Catholic Church in the year 1600, but contrary to popular belief, he was not executed for his belief in other worlds. The problems the church had with him were mostly theological, including allegedly denying the divinity of Christ, which of course would get you in big trouble in 1600. Anyway, to see aliens in actual fiction, we have to move forward to 1634 with Johannes Kepler's novel, which was really a short story, but people call it a novel, Somnium, The Dream, which as the title suggests, describes a dream of a trip to the moon. Somnium was another instructional work. It was meant to teach astronomy rather than satirize, but it was still in that same spirit in that it was written to make a rhetorical point rather than entertain, although it was actual fiction. After that, we have Cyrano de Bergerac's 1656 novel A Voyage to the Moon, or to use its full title, The Other World, Comical History of the States and Empires of the Moon, which is exactly what it sounds like, and is also a satire. You may know Cyrano as the guy with the nose in Edmund Rostrand's 1897 play about him. The bottom line is that the kind of space aliens we are familiar with don't really appear in literature until H.G. Wells wrote The War of the Worlds in 1898. Time travel is another sci-fi trope that often comes up in older stories, although that one's a little more complicated. Rip Van Winkle or Sleeping Beauty-esque quote-unquote time travel where someone simply sleeps for many years has been in literature from antiquity, 
but traveling back in time is another matter. Personally, I consider the first real time travel story to be A Christmas Carol, for reasons I'll explain in the next episode. But the book that's most often cited as the first time travel story is Samuel Madden's Memoirs of the 20th Century from 1733. Although, even if it's the first, it's not a very good one. You see, the story goes that the protagonist was given a series of letters by a guardian angel from the far-off year of 1997. What do these letters say about the future? Well, things are pretty much exactly the same, except that the evil Catholics are taking over the world. You guessed it, it's another satire. And it's not much for time travel either. There's only a vague notion of trying to avoid this bad future, not to mention it had basically no cultural impact until it was rediscovered centuries later. Meanwhile, A Christmas Carol was very innovative, but it was still a ghost story, which is another category. Scientifically minded time travel didn't appear until, again, H.G. Wells wrote The Time Machine in 1895. But I'll talk about Wells later. The bottom line is that ideas we now consider staples of science fiction were considered so silly before the 19th century that you only really see them used as jokes. So you can see that sci-fi followed a very different path from fantasy literature. Even though modern literature groups them together, and many works deliberately blur the line between them, not least Star Wars. Science fiction, in my view, grew out of the Enlightenment, while modern fantasy was descended from those myths and legends. The Lord of the Rings, which arguably defined the genre of fantasy afterwards, was directly inspired by Norse and Germanic mythology. And earlier works, especially children's literature like The Wizard of Oz and Peter Pan, were very clearly successors to the fairy tales of earlier centuries. They became combined mainly through the pulp magazines of the early 20th century. Okay, so that's the historical background. The other half of this podcast is where I want to give an overview of the major books covered by the topic of each episode. I've got six classics on my list that fall under this category of early satire, so let's start at the beginning. What is Utopia, and why is it sometimes called the first science fiction novel? Utopia was written in 1516 by Sir Thomas More, St. Thomas More to the Catholics. It purports to describe the voyage of a world traveler named Raphael, who visited the island of Utopia, which he describes as the ideal society. You may see parallels with Gulliver's travels, especially if you've read that whole book. Ideal is, of course, relative to its time in the early 1500s. Utopia has slaves, for one, and keeping in mind this was a hundred years before American chattel slavery even existed. But other parts are surprisingly modern, and communist. You see, Utopia is a planned society, structured so as to discourage greed and war, with no private property and work schedules being designed so that everyone shares the work and can cut down on working hours. There's a welfare state, freedom of religion, and representative government. And it's really a study in contradictions. Thomas More was a devout Catholic. I mean, this was the guy who served as Henry VIII's Lord Chancellor and then was executed by him when he opposed breaking away from the Catholic Church. He was serious about it. And yet Utopia seems to go completely against this at times. This seemingly ideal society has divorce, female priests, and even euthanasia, none of which fit in the Catholic Church today, let alone in the 1500s. One minute, it seems like Moore was genuinely trying to design an ideal society, pointing out the problems of his own society and possible solutions, and then he drops something that seems completely out of place for 1516, Catholic or Protestant. It's not always clear why Moore wrote what he did. Maybe because it's so distant in time and I'm missing the cultural context. Maybe because he meant the whole thing to be ironic, even the positive parts. But it makes for a very intriguing read. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking about the book, but the real question is why is this considered science fiction? After all, there's not really anything in Utopia that was impossible in Moore's day, except perhaps for Utopia being so rich in gold that every family has enough to make two slave collars and a chamber pot. It makes sense in context. I haven't done a deep dive into this topic, and if any of you have, I'd be happy to hear it. But my best guess is that it's because Utopia describes the unreal, but not in a magical or mystical way. Instead, it's described in a philosophical or rational way, which prefigures the Enlightenment and modern science. 
That's the impression I get from reading it, at least. And you can't deny this is an important book. Even though most people haven't read Utopia, the cultural impact of it has been huge, to the point where it's become both a word in our language and a whole genre of fiction. The concepts of both a truly ideal society and a society that seems ideal but is deeply messed up under the surface appear again and again in later literature, especially in science fiction, which is why I feel safe in calling it one of the roots of sci-fi. And I think this tension between the ideal society and the messed up society is interesting because the word utopia is actually a pun. You don't notice because it's a pun in Greek, but it's kind of like spelling nowhere with a K in The Guardians of the Galaxy. Thomas More derived the word from the Greek utopia spelled O-U-T-O-P-I-A, which means no place. But in English, that word is pronounced the same as utopia spelled E-U-T-O-P-I-A, which means good place. So utopia starting with just a U is both a good place and a place that doesn't exist. If you want to read Utopia, you can get it free at the Open Utopia, Project Gutenberg, in audiobook form through LibriVox, in the original Latin through the Fogler Shakespeare Library, and those are just the links on Wikipedia. That's the good thing about these old books, they're pretty much everywhere. I'm not going to spend this much time on all of the books on my reading list, but there's one more that deserves a close look in this episode, Gulliver's Travels. Other than just the title of Utopia, Gulliver's Travels is probably the most famous of these early satirical books, and it's another book that's frequently called the first science fiction novel. Interestingly, both Isaac Asimov and Carl Sagan picked Kepler's Somnium as the first, but you probably won't hear that opinion as often. Gulliver's Travels was written in 1726 by famed Irish satirist Jonathan Swift. It describes the four voyages of Lemuel Gulliver, who traveled to strange countries that were often a parody of aspects of his own society in the British Isles. Again, the cultural impact of this book has been huge. Even if you've never heard of it, you've probably seen the image of Gulliver tied down with tiny ropes by the six-inch-tall Lilliputians. A hidden race of little people was hardly a new idea. Swift was Irish, so think leprechauns. But the idea of a society that's exactly like ours, but smaller, also appears again and again in later stories, in everything from The Twilight Zone to South Park. But I think the most surprising thing about Gulliver's Travels is that this whole adventure was only the first quarter of the book. If you're familiar with the story, you will know that on his second voyage, Gulliver finds himself in the land of the 60-foot-tall Brobdingnagians, who are much more civilized than the Europeans of the time, aside from being bigger. On his third voyage, he winds up in Laputa, where the people are normal-sized, but in one of the most clearly sci-fi parts of the story, Laputa is an island that flies through the air using magnets. And remember, this was before even the hot air balloon was invented. There's also a whole sequence of mad scientists doing weird experiments in the academy on the mainland. After making a few more stops to fictional islands, and Japan weirdly, Gulliver takes his fourth voyage. On this voyage, he is mutinied against and stranded on an island with a race of brutal subhumans called Yahoos. Yes, really. And the Hoynhenners. That's H-O-U-Y-H-N-H-N-M-S. The Hoynhenners are a highly refined and cultured people, and living with them causes Gulliver to lose all sense of humanity, because the Hoynhenners are, in fact, talking horses. You can see where the name comes from. But for all the sci-fi elements you see in this story, and there are quite a few, it's still satire. Here's a fun fact. You may know about Lilliput, but you might not have heard that Lilliput had a neighbor, Blefuscu, which was also inhabited by tiny people, and that Lilliput and Blefuscu were at war over the correct way to crack an egg. Swift puts in some obvious references to the conflict between Catholics and Protestants in England when he talks about this, in case it wasn't clear who the target was. The satire is strong with this one. As an aside, we get one other interesting reference from Gulliver's Travels. The terms Big Endian and Little Endian in the field of computer science come from this story of the War of the Egg. By now, you may be seeing a pattern between these two novels and others I mentioned in passing. In addition to being satirical, many of these proto-sci-fi novels were also traveler's tales, in which a voyager sails to a far-off country and discovers that it's really weird. 
Utopia and Gulliver's Travels aren't alone in this. Cyrano's A Voyage to the Moon features a narrator traveling to the moon, with rockets no less, and meeting the people there. The people on the moon have four legs, musical voices, and weapons that cook game when you shoot it. I mean, that sounds like something out of Dr. Seuss. Then there's Erewhon, the 1872 novel by Samuel Butler. Like Utopia, Erewhon is a pun. It's an anagram for nowhere. Erewhon is a strange land where illness is punished with jail time, crime is treated with bed rest, and all technology newer than the Renaissance is forbidden, for fear that it will evolve and machines will take over the world. If that sounds familiar, the Butlerian Jihad in the Dune novels takes its name from Butler and his novel. And then you have Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court from 1889, which is exactly what it sounds like. This one is a lot closer to pure fantasy, with the protagonist, Sir Boss, being transported back in time by magic. But there are sci-fi parts too, since Sir Boss spends a lot of time introducing Camelot to modern science and technology. All of these qualify as traveler's tales in one way or another, and a lot of modern science fiction does too. There's only so much you can do here on Earth, after all. But I've got one other satirical novel for you that doesn't fall into this category. Flatland, by Edwin Abbott Abbott, not to be confused with his father, who was just Edwin Abbott, could maybe be called mathematical fiction. It's about a two-dimensional creature named A Square, living in a world where all of the people are geometric shapes. Women are line segments, working class men are triangles, many-sided polygons are nobility, and the circles, who consider themselves perfect, are the priest kings of society. Eventually, A Square meets the Sphere, who teaches him to see the third dimension. Abbott puts a surprising amount of effort into constructing a plausible scientific basis for how his two-dimensional world could operate, but he mostly uses it to satirize his own society. With its rigid class system, authoritarian rulers, blatant sexism, and disdain for the lower classes, Flatland is a pretty clear parody of Victorian England. So that's an overview of the origins of science fiction in satire. As I said last episode, I want to end every episode with a book recommendation from my reading list, and for this one, my recommendation is Gulliver's Travels. You can find it at Project Gutenberg, the audiobook at LibriVox, a scan of the original version, which is in English, on the Internet Archive, and probably more. It's a bit of a dense read, but I got through it in middle school, and I really enjoyed it. Plus, it's the most famous book on the list for this episode, so I hope you'll enjoy it too. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available on Libsyn, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com, and hopefully Apple Podcasts and Google Play Music by the time you're listening to this. I think I've got all of those sorted out now, so you can choose your preferred platform from any of them, or leave a comment if you want to listen somewhere else. Next episode, we'll explore gothic horror, and what I consider to be the first real science fiction novel, Frankenstein. Thanks for listening.